Hello, uh, we're going to be covering chapter 11, which is about gender for introduction to sociology. Uh, just briefly, this picture represents the finest couple um, in the late Renaissance. This, of course, David Beckham and his lovely wife, Posh Spice, represent the great couple of today. So, um, clearly, gender expectations um, have radically changed through the years. So, let's start off with some general information about uh, what has been statistically found. As a man, your income will be higher. You are more likely that you will be the head of a corporation, more likely to run your own business, more likely to be elected to political office, but it's not all good because you're also more likely to die a violent death and more likely to die before your female spouse. Um, on average, these days, women who are born the same year as their husbands tend to live five to seven years longer. So, um, men are built for speed, women are built for endurance, as they say. Now, as a woman, income will be lower. On average, women earn 77 cents for every dollar a man earns. They will shoulder the majority of the child rearing and the majority of the housekeeping. They tend to be more afraid to walk down the street alone. However, they also tend to be happier when it comes to parenting and to be more satisfied with friendships. And as I mentioned in the previous slide, they are more likely to outlive their male spouse. So let's talk about some definitions before we move forward. From the moment our gender is identified in utero, we begin to do what's called gender typing. We buy pink clothes for the girl, blue clothes for the boy. Uh, we get a pink teddy bear for the girl and a blue teddy bear for the boy. Um, you know, dad goes out and buys his little slugger a new baseball. He's not even born yet. Football, baseball, hockey stick. For the little girl, it's time to go get the dolls and the Barbies and the princess stuff from Disney. So, you know, literally from the minute we are identified as one gender or another, society has begun to dictate to us what is appropriate. Uh, a couple other definitions. We have sex, which is the biological identity. And that pretty much boils down to male or female. Now, there are some issues that come with genetic defects we'll talk about later in this slideshow. Uh, gender refers to the socially learned expectations and behaviors with each sex. So gender, and that's the focus of this slideshow, is really more about the idea of what society expects from you as a man or as a woman. And keeping in mind that in different countries there are different expectations placed on gender. So let's talk about gender socialization. Uh, men and women learn the expectations associated with their sex, i.e. if they're male or female, through socialization. Gender socialization is reinforced whenever gender-linked behaviors receive approval or disapproval from multiple influences. Family, peers, school, religion, media, culture, all of those socializing agents we've talked about. Now, over there on the right-hand side, you're going to see a couple comics um, or a couple ads from the 1950s or 60s, which will really define for you what gender socialization looked like 50 years ago. Um, the Van Heusen tie ad, the woman is on her knee serving her husband his breakfast. He is fully dressed with his tie, and she is on her knees. Um, if you wanted to get into some of the interpretive qualities, um, a lot of the uh, marketing people would tell you that his tie is really a phallic symbol. And her on her knees is an intentional way of subjugating her uh, presentation. The next advertisement where it says, So the harder a wife works, the cuter she looks. And the ad is actually for vitamins that will pep you up. And 
basically what this says is a woman is more beautiful when she keeps your house clean so um, this is how women were being gender socialized back in the 50s and 60s now below that is an advertisement that probably many of you may have seen on a regular basis every holiday season on the left you have all the boy toys and notice that it's spider-man it's darth vader it's a pirate it's all of these action figures then on the right what we see is all of the little girls dressed as princesses and this again really defines for people what is expected of their gender so a little girl who wants to grow up to become Darth Vader is going to be essentially not necessarily told but essentially demonstrated by society that 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 is not an appropriate um, aspiration for her gender so let's look at gender identity a person's definition of oneself as a man or a woman this means that when we are looking at ourselves we define our sense of gender by how we feel about ourselves so oftentimes you'll see little girls when they're eight nine years old who are tomboys they play baseball they wear jeans they run around with the boys and then as they get older and especially with girls they get older and they enter adolescence their self-esteem and attitude about their body decreases as their body develops so that little tomboy now becomes very focused on the fact that she doesn't look like the boys and she actually has breasts and her body is developing in ways that she may not be comfortable with and consequently she feels that she doesn't look right and unfortunately for a lot of women this goes on well into their adult years um, interestingly this is a comic this is Dora when she was little and this is Dora when she grows up uh, notice her clothes in this picture on the left are almost unisex in their um, presentation except for the colors and then you move over to the right and she's got longer hair and she has uh, a dress with leggings and she's got jewelry on and all of those things that signify a girl parents play a huge role in all of this and parents tend to be more tolerant of girls who are tomboys than boys who are we call girly and that's in quotation marks peers are also much more accepting of tomboys than feminine boys um, a few years ago this book on the right hand side came out called my princess boy and it was about a little boy who wanted to be a princess and have a tiara and a and a wand and all that other stuff that princesses have and it caused a lot of consternation because people felt that it was encouraging little boys to grow up to be gay and the reality is there's quite a few heterosexual men who tend to be a little bit more focused on their appearance not interested in sports and have a much different perspective on what it is to be a man the problem lies in the fact that we as a society have those expectations that boys are rough and tumble and like sports and don't care about pretty things and the fact of the matter is that it's just not true the other issue is that men have been more involved in child care but they're still falling short of the contribution the mother makes and this gap between perception and reality often causes conflict with the woman and what you also see is that the kids tend to take sides they see that mom does all the work and that dad is kind of a slacker so they tend to go to mom for things more and more which only makes her more stressed out um, and again that's showing kids that dad gets to come home and sit down and do nothing whereas mom has to cook dinner and make sure the homework is done and make sure everybody gets to bed and do the laundry and all that other stuff so it causes a lot of issues in terms of understanding the responsibilities of each gender in a marriage then we have something called genderized play 
And again, what you see here is significant differences in how boys and girls are treated by their parents. Boys are encouraged to play outside. Girls are encouraged to play inside. The toys that boys play with are much more militaristic and tend to encourage aggressive, violent behavior. And you don't really see this very often in girls' toys. Interestingly, boys are more often seen in children's books. However, the fathers rarely are. So if you think about the, the big books that have come out for young adults and for kids in the last few years, you have a predominantly... Um, male main character such as Harry Potter and then you know the female character is not equal but she's there in the background like Hermione uh, now you did have a book come out of several years ago that has been turned into successful movie series uh, the Hunger Games where Katniss Everdeen is the main character but if you look at her gender identity, and this is the important thing to keep in mind, her gender identity, she's strong, she is self-sufficient, she takes care of her mother and sister, she's the one who goes hunting. She's the one who sacrifices herself to save her sister. And she's the one who's a much better hunter than the boy who is selected from the same area, PETA, and he is much more interested in pretty things. He decorates cakes. He's all about the um, appearance. So if you only look at the gender identity, clearly Katniss is the boy and Peta is more of the girl. However, you know, in terms of how the book is written, it is reinforced that Katniss is definitely a girl with boy behaviors. So now let's look at gender's development and how religion plays a role. Um, the Abrahamic religions, which are Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, which pretty much is the majority um, of people in the United States by far, place an explicit preference of boys over girls. In Judaism, men offer a prayer to God that they were born a man and not a woman. Um, over here on the right-hand side, you'll see a quote from the Bible, wives must submit to their husbands, which um, is not real popular amongst most women these days. And then below that, you'll see a cover story in Time Magazine about um, how the Taliban, which is a extremist group that... Um, basically denigrates the role of women. This is how they punish women by cutting off their noses. Um, so, you know, what we see here is a very specific perception that women are not as important as men within these three very large religions. Next, we're going to look at how the media plays a role in our gender development. And again, depends on what you're watching. That's really the thing. So what you have to think about are the shows that young people watch. And they tend to be all over the map because some people like to watch um, comedy, some people like reality shows, some people like shoot 'em up zombie movies and shows. But what we see here on average is a lot of the women are hypersexualized, which doesn't mean that they're very, very sex, um, sex oriented, but they're dressed in such a way that it emphasizes their bosom or their buttocks. Um, alternatively, they can be the loving mother who knows all the answers and can solve all of life's problems in 22 minutes. Alternatively, men are stereotyped often as sex crazed, like Barney in How I Met Your Mother, antisocial, or as the clueless father. Um, and again, it doesn't necessarily mean that these are bad shows. We just tend to see certain characters over and over and over again. And as a consequence to that, we become, un we come to the understanding that this is normal behavior when it's not. Another element that I want to bring up is a theory called biological determinism. 
This is the belief that human behavior is controlled solely by an individual's genes or some component of their physiology. Now, the thing is that we can say boys will be boys or girls will be girls, um, but of course, you know, what do scientists do? They test this. So the thought process is that men are more aggressive, or the hypothesis, men are more aggressive because they have more of the hormone testosterone. However, when they test this scientifically, it doesn't always work. So during early childhood, ages two and three, there is a lack of the sex hormones in children, meaning testosterone. The first testosterone surge tends to kick in around age four, but it has been demonstrated that boys are much more aggressive than girls of the same age. And again, the thought process from a sociological point of view is that the socializing factors, especially our families, have a significant impact on how we see appropriate behavior in a gender. So what is the influence of our social expectations? It is our gender expectations of power and violence in men that reinforce the acceptability of violence against women. And you know, on the left there, you'll see an ad, Dolce and & Gabbana, and this was in all kinds of magazines. You have four men standing around a woman who's being held down. Two of the men are shirtless. One guy has his shirt almost totally unbuttoned, and the other guy just seems to be watching as um, she is being held down. You know, this is not necessarily a very sexy ad because there is this hint of menace and fear. So what we see here is an advertisement getting people to buy a certain kind of clothes and I believe this might have been a jeans ad or a shoe ad um, based on this particular vignette. Then you have on the right hand side a discussion or an, um, a list of people who have been accused of domestic abuse with the understanding Adrian Peterson didn't actually hit his wife, he hit his child. Um, you know, these guys are lauded athletes and really there are very little consequences to them when they uh, beat up their wives. Um, just um, at University of Virginia there was an article in Rolling Stone magazine about how this girl was gang raped at a fraternity and it was basically hushed up because the fraternities were so powerful that they had that ability and as a consequence there's all kinds of stuff coming out now and uh, University of Virginia is doing some very fast backpedaling to try and um, reconcile the issues with sexual violence and violence against women in general. Now we get to an interesting group called intersexed humans. These are people who are born hermaphroditic. Basically they have mixed biological characteristics because of a chromosomal irregularity these people are born oftentimes with both sets of reproductive organs or they may have an external genitalia that doesn't match their internal reproductive system. So for example, um, you might have a little boy on the outside, but on the inside, the little boy has a uterus and fallopian tubes or vice versa. These four women on the left hand side were all born intersexed and their parents were advised to decide upon a gender and support that decision using social signals, clothing styles, toys, and haircuts. So one of the issues that you see here is that <clears throat> you are essentially taking a child that's born with both male and female parts and turning them into one gender or another. And because of that, they may grow up with a very confused sense of self. The issue, and you'll notice that all four of these people are women, and in terms of the uh, urology of the system, and that's the most important thing for the surgeons at that time, it is much easier to create a female than to make a male. So oftentimes these mixed gender children are 
converted to females um, just for the sake of easy urology issues. Then we have another very interesting group called transgender people. And they deviate from the binary choices of male or female. So oftentimes you may have heard, you know, somebody becomes a man when they used to be a woman or a woman who becomes a man. But what's really interesting within this transgender community is some choose to keep certain parts of their bodies that may signify a particular gender. So you do happen to see a lot of people go through the surgery to get breasts, like if a man wanted to be a woman, but they don't necessarily remove their penis. Now you do have other people who go all the way. They transition completely. Um, they get their genitalia removed or changed. They have uh, breast implants or they have their breasts um, taken off and they grow hair on their face. On the left you'll see Chastity Bono who is now Chaz Bono. She converted to a man. Um, in the middle you'll see uh, an actress by the name of Laverne Cox who's on the very popular show Orange is the New Black and she was born a man and became a woman and she plays a transgender individual on the television show as well. Then over there on the right hand side um, for those of you who have ever seen The Matrix or Bound or a dozen other movies, uh, the gentleman is named Larry Wachowski and he went through, he was the producer and director of those movies and he went through a sex change and is now known as Lana Wachowski. So the issue here is that a lot of them feel a tremendous social pressure to embrace one gender or another. Um, our society is very binary in the sense that you're either a boy or a girl. You can't be both. You can't be mixed. And so um, a lot of times these folks won't discuss their sex change details because they haven't transitioned 100% yet. So the takeaway is that there's not a fixed relationship between gender and and social construction. Social construction means that society builds our understanding. So this young woman who's on the left side of your screen who is a bodybuilder is somebody that society would look at and go, ooh, girls shouldn't have those kind of muscles. Yet in the bodybuilding world she is a world-class competitor. Um, we, all of us go through certain phases in our lives where we may not like what society wants us to do and we tend to rebel. Um, and it allows us to experiment with how society sees us because that's really the issue. Society constructs our identity for us and then we either accept it or reject it like the little boy in the center who's got his Barbie doll collection. So what do the theorists say about gender? Functionalists say that men fill instrumental roles in society, whereas women fill expressive roles. So men get stuff done and women make you feel better. Um, they would say that gender inequality in the workplace is due to the choices women make. For example, to leave work for a few years to raise her children. Um, conflict theorists see that women are disadvantaged by power inequities that are built into the system. They would say that gender inequality is produced by men's historic power in these areas. So, for example, in Pennsylvania, if you're pregnant and you need to take three months off of work, you don't get temporary disability, although you can get it in many other states. And the perception is that in Pennsylvania, women are not valued in the same way that a man is because she is not given the opportunity to have a family. Whereas the man, he never has to take time off because he can't have babies. So it's an inequity that's built into the system. 
Lastly, the social interactionists believe that behavior and its associated reinforcement is something made up and perpetuated by social connections. So, in other words, the social construction of gender identity. So, two very interesting studies about gender that I wanted to share with you. The first one is a study about African American women and their socialization. And they have been socialized, especially by their own mothers, to become self-sufficient, pursue an education, desire an occupation, and see work as an expected part of her life. African American women have a much higher rate of graduating college than African American men. Um, and oftentimes much higher than Caucasian men or women or Hispanic men or women. So African American women have been socialized to be independent and a lot of theorists believe that it had something to do with the crack epidemic in the 80s in the ghettos where a lot of the men left um, or were killed or were incarcerated and women had to take care of themselves. Now on the other side of the coin, Latin men are taught, are socialized, that exaggerated masculinity is very appropriate as well as honor, dignity, and respect. Interestingly though, Latino families tend to share equal responsibility and decisions between men and women. So a, La a Latino man is going to be more likely to be very macho, but is also going to respect the woman he's with so that they can make equal choices. Then we move into a element of gender identity that is really more about sexual identity. And this, we're going to start off talking about homosexuality and Ellen over here, the most famous lesbian in the world probably. A per, um, homosexuals are people who are sexually and emotionally attracted to someone of the same sex. And when we say emotionally attracted, that's a very important um, idea. Because if you're <clears throat> drunk one night and you hook up with somebody of the same gender, that doesn't make you gay. What it does is it makes you experimental. The vast majority of us experiment and then go back to the opposite gender. But there is a portion of the po population that doesn't just experiment. They realize that they don't have emotional attraction to the opposite gender. Rather, they have the emotional attraction to their own gender. This is about 5% of the U.S. population. Homophobia, to be defined, is the fear and hatred of homosexuals. And uh, attitudes towards gays and lesbians have changed over time with each new generation. So this is a survey from 2012, and it shows the level of support for same-sex marriage. Now, if you are 18 to 34, it is at 73% support it. And as the people get older, and again, this is not as people get older themselves, but the generation groups, the groups of people who are now over 65 only support it 34% of the time. So, you know, what we're seeing here is that the younger generation is much more accepting of different options within the gender or sexual identity um, rainbow, so to speak. Society encourages a strict conformity to traditional expectations, especially for boys. Um, this is a football player by the name of Michael Sams, and um, he is the first openly gay football player to be recruited by a team. Of course, he didn't make the cut when it came time to actually play, but this man is huge. He was an excellent college player. He looks mean, and when you see him standing next to his boyfriend, it's very disconcerting. So... You know, we have this image in society of what a man should look like, but when his behavior oftentimes doesn't match how he looks, it still causes problems in society in terms of how people perceive him, not in how he lives his life. Therefore, traits that are seen as traditionally female, such as caring, nurturing, empathy, emotion, and gentleness, are discouraged in boys who fear being labeled. 
and here's an advertisement for a nursing school are you man enough to be a nurse well the fact of the matter is that the same skills you need to work in most fields are available in both men and women and yet we specifically look at nurses are supposed to be female why because nurses are supposed to be kind and helpful and nurturing and you know the idea that men could be kind nurturing and helpful just seems foreign which it shouldn't so a few more concepts for this chapter a matriarchy is a society in which women have social and economic power over men. Um, pretty much you don't see a lot of matriarchies in history. Uh, the Amazon women were a matriarchy. You also see certain um, small groups in Africa where women were the uh, majority and had uh, significant power because they controlled their reproductive systems. Much more prevalent is the patriarchy, which is a society which men have power over women in private matters, i.e. the home, and in institutions. So not being able to vote, no access to birth control, lack of opportunities in jobs and education. Now go back to 1920 when women got the vote in the United States. And the concern was that women were too, quote unquote, soft headed to make political choices. Um, clearly, that's not true anymore. Um, although, sometimes when you see somebody like Sarah Palin, no, just kidding, and in institutions, so, you know, lack of birth control, employers now of certain kinds of companies can dictate to their employees what kind of birth control the insurance will cover, um, which a lot of women find horrifying. Additionally, women's clinics are shut down on a regular basis because they perform abortions. And what you then see is women not being able to not only get an abortion, but not only cannot get access to birth control because the clinic was the only place she could afford. In jobs that used to be dominated by men, as women moved into them they and became the majority of that job, the wages declined. So let's talk about gender wage inequality. So first of all, you know, the question is why do women make 77 cents for every dollar a man makes? Before I go into the human capital theory, I want to explain how this figure was reached. Essentially, they took every man who works in this country and every woman who works in this country and they averaged their wages and came up with this percentage. However, this did not take into account men versus women doctors, men versus women lawyers, men versus women truck drivers. Rather, it's the entire context of the employment market. So, human capital theory is that pay differentials come from the individual characteristics that workers bring to a job. So, for example, and we've talked about this before, women take time off to have children, so their value is not equal to men. The only problem is that in a society where we are encouraged to embrace family values, you can't actually have a family without the woman getting pregnant. So in that context what they're saying is women are being penalized for their ability to give birth. Another aspect is called the dual labor market. This is when men and women earn different amounts because one particular gender tends to work in a specific labor market. And here are some very female-centric jobs. 82% of elementary and middle school teachers are women. 97% of secretaries and assistants. 90% of bookkeepers and 94% of child, ca child care workers are women. And you tend to see the wages in each of those categories much significantly lower than um, jobs that are exclusively or heavily dominated by men. Jobs that are viewed as women's work tend to be devalued in prestige and economic value. 
And what we do see is male nurses and female soldiers are often seen through the prism of homophobia. So if you have a woman and she is dressed in fatigues or camouflage, she has to be a lesbian because no straight woman would want to put on a uniform and go fight for her country, which of course is just absurd. In some countries, um, military service is required. So like in Israel, everybody, every man and woman eventually serves one or two years in the military. Lastly, we want to talk about something called institutional discrimination. And again, this is why women tend to make less, more, less money than men. The dominant power structure, men, have excluded women and racial minorities from well-paying jobs. Wall Street financial management is 90% male. That's not to say that women don't go into finance. They just don't get promoted. The vast majority of employees in science, technology, and engineering are male, and high-paying construction jobs such as electrician, plumber, tend to be exclusively male also. So when you are looking at this kind of thing, what you have to keep in mind is that when the dominant power structure sets up the system to work a particular way, anyone who is not part of that dominant power system is going to struggle. So the same opportunities that are available to a man are not available to a woman. And the same responsibilities that women have are not the same as men have. So that's going to finish up this chapter. If you have any questions, please feel free to text or email me. And I hope you have a terrific day. Bye.